get started. Um, so my name is Mike Morrow. I'm the president of the St. John Center of the RESC. And I'm going to start with an acknowledgement. Um, we respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavit and Nunatukavit and the Innu of Natasinan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. Okay, so um, before we get too much further along, um, I'd like to call our observing director, Robert Babb down to make a presentation and somebody else in the audience can start getting ready to move. <laughs> So Robert, take it away. Maybe you should come over here and talk by the microphone. Yes. Uh, we have, or I have the uh, pleasure to, uh, say again? Oh yeah, we get a picture. Uh, to um, present this uh, observing certificate to uh, Jeff Hiscock for his endeavor to explore the moon like nobody has ever explored before. That's not true. <laughs> That's not true. Well, uh, so we have a, a pin and a certificate. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, maybe we hold it around here a little bit. There you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Another pin to go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So congratulations, Jeff. And uh, so how many of those do you have now? I, I should have had this up when we were doing that. Okay. I think this is only my second one from okay. the, the Royal Astronomical Society, but I got about five or six from the Astronomical Union. Okay. Well, the Astronomical and League. And I just I probably got four lunar ones now. Good. <laughs> so you're, so one more to go. One more to go. So you're a lunacy, for sure. Well, <laughs> most of what I'm doing is binoculars. Yes. So I'm I'm aiming for the Master Binocular Observing Award from the Astronomical League. Wow. I'm doing three <clears> programs <throat> concurrently right now, and I'm leaving one more to go. I got to do nine. Wow. I'm almost finished. Well, Another couple of years, I'd say. It takes about a year to do a program. Yeah. So that's why I run three at the same time. Yeah, well, you know, good for you and congratulations on that effort. That's noble. Thank you very much. Yep, congratulations. Maybe we'll get you to do a... That's the second time I've been asked, and I'm soon going to say yes. Okay. <laughs> we need to bring the executive position. We're expert. Make sure you're doing okay. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. So Randy, is the audio still okay? Okay. We're so for the people online, we're trying an experiment with a new microphone um, this week, which may or may not make things better, but. Uh, this has been a learning experience all the way along. So um, a couple of announcements. The uh, next month's meeting is gonna be February 15th. And um, uh, it's gonna be Gary talking about uh, filters for visual observing. And uh, some of you might be interested. There's a um, comet observing workshop coming up. We'll hear why that's, why, there's some interest in comets right now uh, later on. Being run from the Kitchener-Waterloo Center, you have to pre-register. And um, so there is a link um, that you can click on to register, um, but you probably haven't copied the link down, be just but impossible. But maybe if you get in touch with Randy or me, we could uh, 
pass that link along to you if you're interested. And there's also um, coming up on January 31st, uh, the one, two, three, third or fourth now, I guess. Um, it's the third one coming up. Uh, Education and Public Outreach Town Hall. Um, we presented in the first one. Um, and so they're working their way from east to west. And so there's uh, some presentations from Ontario, some more Ontario centers. Um, it's 8.30 our time. And again, you have to register and um, you can email Samantha Jewett, who's the outreach person at RESC. Um, that one's easy, outreach at resc.ca, or ask Randy or me and we can forward the link. Um, Randy's gotten his link for registering. I haven't yet, so I don't know how slowly that's working. Um, so that's a few announcements right now. And uh, this got forwarded to me. Um, at some point, yeah, so... And everybody still looks pretty much the same, right? <laughs> so, uh, he hasn't changed at all. That's so that's Peter there. A little bit, yeah. And Randy is hiding out and uh, show for a long sight. So don't know her, but anyway, said and Peter Lock with his. In the back oh, right, right, yeah, he's no. looking at, uh, he didn't want to be in the picture. Yeah. Anyways, I thought that was great. Um, so that's 1979. Uh, so um, I'll just mention, I, I think a lot of people are members, but I'll just mention that uh, the benefits of membership include a supportive community. Um, one of the real benefits of membership here is the uh, chat line, there's a lot of uh, mentoring goes on there and sharing of observations and just uh, sort of heads up when there's something to look at. And But you have to contact Randy to join. There's the publications, some samples here, equipment rentals and observing sessions, which are a little bit on hold right now, um, but maybe we'll get going again um, when it warms up. And there are also, uh, you should be getting the weekly newsletter and the monthly bulletin. Um, and if you're not, I assume everybody's getting that because no one has ever gotten in touch to say they aren't. And so the next order of business is um, a speaker with the same name as me giving a talk about um, uh, the Lucy mission, which is NASA's mission to the Trojan asteroid. So I'll introduce myself. I'm Mike Laurel. Okay, so that part's done. Now I need to lower this and uh, get the that talk going. Wish I knew how to make that go way at the top there, but sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So um, I got interested in this, um, not because I know anything about asteroids, um, but this, this mission, how's that? Okay, um, this mission launched a little over a year ago, it was October, 2021. And what really caught my attention was the path that this probe is gonna to travel to do what it's gonna do. And it's not gonna finish what it's, well, it may not finish what it's doing for a very long time, but it won't finish its primary mission until 2033. So it's going to the Trojan asteroids. And some of you may know that those are asteroids that are in the same orbit as Jupiter You're not. The slide. 
Okay, let me stop sharing and um, make sure that I share that screen. Is that it? Good. Okay. Perfect. Uh, can you remind me where I was? Let's see. Um, 2033, right. Um, so it's it's actually going to, uh, so the, the Trojan asteroids are asteroids that are orbiting um, in the same orbit as uh, Jupiter at uh, Lagrange points, but not the Lagrange points we heard about um, when we heard about the Webb telescope, a different kind of Lagrange point. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what that means and a little bit about how this um, probe is actually getting out there and not very much about asteroids, maybe a little bit about what the motivation for this is. Now, one of the things to watch for as I go through um, is some of the diagrams they're going to show you are um, from the point of view of an observer that's sort of stuck on Jupiter. So sort of going around the sun with Jupiter, we talk about the frame of reference. Others are gonna be from the point of view of um, an om omniscient observer sort of looking down on the solar system, sort of stationary with respect to the sun. So I'll point those out as we go along, but um, the result is when you change that point of view, the picture looks different. You'll see what I mean as we get along but also the way you understand what's going on is a little bit different. And that turns out um, to be important in some interesting ways. So that sounds pretty mis mysterious, but we'll get to that. Um, so why is it called Lucy? Well, Lucy, the Lucy mission is named after this fossil, which is, oh, I spelled Australopithecus wrong. Uh, it was discovered in 1974 by Donald Johansson, remember his name, um, dated to about 3.2 million years ago. It was very exciting because it, um, you know, it was uh, sort of an intermediate uh, form of hominid. It was, um, it, it showed that bipedalism, being able to walk on two feet, in, uh, preceded the increase in brain size. So a lot was learned um, about human evolution from this fossil. It was named Lucy because one of the songs that was very popular in 1974 was? Lucy. Right, okay. Um, so this was an example of how an undisturbed fossil provided some insight into um, the origins of modern hominids. And so the question is, are there some undiscovered um, relics from the beginning of the solar system that might give us some uh, clues about um, the origins of the solar system? And the answer is, Yes, and that's why this probe is named Lucy. So, um, and sometimes that disappears and sometimes it doesn't. I'm not quite sure how to do that. But anyways, um, so asteroids are um, remnants from the formation of the solar system. They, um, if they're from the right place, they haven't been disturbed or worked very much. Um, so they can provide some information about the conditions in the early solar system and uh, answer some questions. And um, the kinds of questions, there are lots of these kinds of questions, um, but one of them that's starting to come up is we're finding lots of planetary systems now, and a lot of them have a planet that's a lot like Jupiter, but it's much closer to the star than, than our Jupiter is. And so people ask questions like, do these Jupiter-like planets form far from a star and migrate in, um, or do they, um, or maybe vice versa? Um, and then questions like, where, if this is going on, where do the rocky planets and the minor planets uh, uh, form? Where do they come from? And so uh, there's been a lot of effort to learn about asteroids. That, and we, we need to know answers to these sort of things if we're going to understand sort of what's going on in these um, uh, other planetary systems where we're, we're finding. Um, and the first place to learn about this kind of thing is in our own planetary system. 
So there's been lots done on asteroids in general. Um, I want to end it. Yeah, it's, I'm sorry about that bar across the top. I, I've never quite figured out how to make, sometimes it goes away and sometimes it doesn't. Um, anyways, so we can think of the asteroids as uh, solar system uh, fossils. And for today's purposes, we can talk about the asteroids in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And then these Trojan asteroids are in two swarms, one that's leading Jupiter, but more or less on the same orbit, and one swarm that's following Jupiter more or less on the same or orbit. And I listed some of the, or most of the missions to the asteroids. Um, some of them you probably recognize as Cirrus Rex. I talked about DART um, in the fall, um, Hayabusa 2, um, uh, some of the other ones, Stardust. But all of these have been pretty much to the main belt asteroids. So there's been nothing that's uh, visited these, what are called Trojan asteroids. So they're called Trojan asteroids because the ones in one swarm are named after um, warriors in the Trojan army in the Greek myths, and the other swarm is named after the Greek soldiers. I'm not gonna get into that too much. So these asteroids are trapped at Lagrange points. And I'm going to say a little bit more. I'm going to say a lot more about Lagrange points because I find them quite fascinating. Um, and these are L4 and L5. So when we talked about the Webb telescope, when Rick told us about the Webb telescope, if this was the Earth, L2 would be out here. Um, L1 was here. L3 is over here. But we're talking about L4 and L5. Um, there's a lot of them. Oh, and so we're going to see that they're actually equidistant from Jupiter and the sun. So you can make a right uh, uh, equilateral triangle. There's about a million of these that are bigger than uh, a kilometer or so, um, mostly carbon rich material, um, water, ice, silicates, that sort of thing. And I've already mentioned this that how they're named. So there's a couple of ideas. Um, these are, should actually be hypotheses rather than theories. Um, one is that they were formed and captured as um, Jupiter was being formed. Um, but if that was the case, um, that hypothesis would overestimate Trojan population by a lot. Um, or they were captured um, as Jupiter migrated to its current location from somewhere else. Um, either way, learning something about the Trojan asteroids, which we haven't visited yet, is going to provide some information. And I've got another um, image here, I hope this works, um, that sort of shows you the motions. I'm going to come back to this a couple times. So this is the point of view from this sort of omniscient uh, position, sort of looking down on the solar system. So here's the two swarms. You can see they are not... Okay? Can't see that. Uh, okay, so just a second, I will stop sharing that and share that one. How's that? Okay. So you can see that these are not tightly packed at a point. Um, they're really quite spread out. There's Jupiter going around. Earth is zipping around in there somewhere. And I want you to notice here that um, what happens is that if the asteroids get to the outside of um, Jupiter's orbit, they sort of drift back. And then when they sort of cross the orbit, they speed up and move forward. So you can see that they're sort of circulating like this as they go around. Now, if you pick out any one of those dots, it's really doing almost a circular orbit but a little bit distorted as it sort of crosses back and forth across Jupiter's orbit. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing that. And now, I, do I need to do this again? Yep. 
ओके okay. oh. yeah, probably didn't pick the right one, but that's okay. There we are. Okay, so I looked up what kinds of asteroids are represented here and came to the conclusion that I don't understand asteroids. Um, they're mostly three types. The D type is the most common. Um, they're, they're also the kind of asteroids that are in the asteroid belt. Um, a red featureless spectrum, which turns out to be pretty much the same for all of them. Um, low albedo, which turns out to be the same for all of them. Uh, silicates, you know, silicon oxides, carbon, some water, um, which also seems to be the same for all of them. So there is some kind of distinction between these asteroids and Gary should know. Do you know what kind of asteroid yours is? Okay. Um, anyways, I, do you know what the difference is between these guys? Okay. But the people who are doing the mission do, so that's the important thing. Um, but it, the mission is going to visit a C-type, which is Donald Johansson. Remember the guy who discovered the fossil was named Donald Johansson. Um, a C-type binary, so um, C-type, but with a little um, asteroid uh, orbiting it, two P-type binaries, a D-type, and one that they're not sure whether it's a D or a C. Okay, so that's it sort of makes sense that they're doing that. So I wanna say a little bit about these Lagrange points because that was one of the things that got me interested in this. So this is actually the picture of the Earth-Sun system because there was lots of material available um, with the Webb telescope. So that's actually the Webb telescope there, but the geometry is the same. So I'm just gonna use this picture. And so we learned about the L2 um, site, um, the L1 and the L3, these ones are actually pretty easy to explain. They, um, so an object at one of these Lagrange points um, isn't feeling any force to move away, but it's not stable. Okay, if it drifts away, it's going to keep going. So if they, so for example, the Webb telescope every once in a while has to have a little um, kick from its motors to get back into position. And so that's where the uh, um, Webb telescope is. Um, these L1, L2, and L3 were actually named by Euler, who was a famous mathematician. Lagrange did the hard math to figure out the four, L4 and L5, and that's why they got named after him. So I'm going to say a little bit about um, L2, first of all, even though it's not really pertinent to um, the Trojan asteroids, I'm going to talk about L2 because I can actually do that math. But you don't have to do the math. But I do want to give you a little bit of an idea about what's going on there. So um, if you think about circular motion, and don't worry, that's not really a lock. It's just a little piece of plastic. So if I get something spinning Overhead. If this was a class, this is where I'd start talking about waivers, but that would just be a joke, right? So in order for this to move, that string is always pulling that mass in towards the center. And if I go faster, I can feel that it takes a little bit more force to keep that mass going in that circle. So that's what we, that's all we need to know about um, force and, and orbits. Um, now, uh, and in fact, if I go twice the speed, I need to, the force that we need to pull that in is um, four times the force. Um, and, but that's the point of view from someone standing outside, okay? In physics, we would say someone in an inertial frame, but don't worry about that observing this, I'm just saying this for Rick, right? Um, that's the only force that's acting on this ball other than gravity, which we ignore. 
for orbits, for something going in an orbit, this force has to come from gravity and gravity depends on how far away the object is. So that complicates things a little bit. But when you put everything together, what you find is that if you've got something in a bigger orbit, it's moving slower. So it's traveling a larger distance and it's going a little bit slower. Okay, now that's really important. If, if you've got two bodies orbiting the same central mass, the bodies that are farther out are going slower and it takes longer for them to go around. So we look at Saturn, it takes what, 12 years to go around? Is that Saturn's, what's? 29. 29, okay, Jupiter's 12 years then I guess. Okay, so a long time to go around. Um, so that, everybody's happy with that. So let's look at this L2 position. So the Webb telescope, which is at L2 for the Earth, is going around a bigger circle than the Earth is. But the whole point is that it's doing that in exactly the same time it takes the Earth to go around. So it's got to be moving faster. So how does that line up with what I just said about you know, something that's going around um, needing more force, where's that extra force come from? Well, it's because of the fact that this arrangement, sun, earth, and that telescope doesn't change relative to each other. So the earth is always in this position relative to the sun and this telescope. So if we're in a, um, a frame of reference on the earth, We'd always see the telescope here. We'd always see the sun there. And so the extra force is coming from the gravity due to Earth. Okay, so that's how that kind of Lagrange um, point works. Euler figured that out. I can almost figure that out. Um, okay, uh, as I said, the period for an object here is the same as the period for this object but it's unstable, so it needs to keep getting pushed back in. Um, so asteroids aren't gonna sit there, but it turns out that L4 and L5 in, in the Earth system, although we don't, I think we maybe have a couple Trojan asteroids, but Jupiter has lots of them. Those positions are stable. And if, if something gets into that position and it gets, it sort of drifts away, it'll, get pulled back in. Um, okay, so L4 and L5, as I said, that distance, so pretend this is Jupiter now, pretend that the Webb telescope isn't there. This is the Trojans, these are the Greeks, I think. Um, this distance from the sun to the L4 swarm is the same as the distance from the L4 swarm to Jupiter and the same thing for L5. Uh, so these are equilateral triangles and an object at these positions that that orbit is more or less stable as long as this mass is more than about 25 times this mass. And that's no problem for the earth. It's no problem for um, the sun and Jupiter. Um, now, uh, If the object gets away from this position, um, it gets pulled back in. Um, and we saw that in the animation of the, um, of the swarms traveling around, um, but the math is pretty complicated. This is a three body system, not in a straight line. So uh, I don't wanna do much with that. Um, but I do wanna show you another picture because if you, look up Lagrange points, you'll see this kind of picture as well. And this is where, so don't panic, but this is where the business about looking at something from sort of an omniscient view, sort of stationary with respect to the sun, or from a frame of reference or viewpoint that's traveling around with this planet, it's Earth in this picture, but we're thinking of it as Jupiter, where that difference comes in. And if when I'm 
doing this, I said that from my point of view, the only force is coming from the string, okay? But if I was a little bug living on this, this actual little tape measure, and I was trying to do physics, I would find that if I let go of something, it would appear to be accelerating outwards. And this is what you've heard. So in physics, in first year, we never talk about um, that force because we do everything in a frame like this frame um, that isn't moving. Um, but if you are on a frame that's moving, you have to have these some other forces, which we call fictitious forces. And this one you've heard, centrifugal force, but we don't say that. We never say centrifugal force in first year, but by third year, maybe you have to say it once in a while. There's another um, fictitious force. So basically, if you're in a frame of reference that's rotating, you have to have these other forces. And I think that Nikolai knows one of those forces, right? The you have to talk about the Coriolis force, which is oh, yeah. a fictitious force because the earth is rotating. If you wanna talk about how uh, a mass of air moves when it's going from the equator up towards the north, you find that it's deflected to the east. And that's because of one of these, it's a more complicated fictitious force. And so that's, that's the deal anyways. So this picture, which some of you may have seen, is the picture, if you look at um, what's going on from a frame of reference that's going, that's sort of fixed in this case on the earth, but we think of that as Jupiter. And what's drawn there are contours of potential energy. So potential energy, if I lift this up, I'm giving it potential energy. If I let it go, that potential energy is turning into the energy of motion, kinetic energy. So if I have a mass, the farther away I get, if I move away from the earth, I want to fall down. I'm getting more and more energy as I move away. My potential energy is going up. That's from sort of a, a, a stationary observer. But in this frame of reference, which is really a rotating frame of reference, we have to include this extra fictitious force, this centrifugal force. And for something that's um, orbiting at exactly the rate at which this frame of reference is going around, once you get to that distance, the distance that corresponds to that orbit, the potential energy drops off. So there's actually sort of a bowl with an edge, okay? And so the Lagrange points are places, so the potential energy increases as you move out from the sun, and but then it's a maximum at the distance that corresponds exactly to um, the distance of something that's rotating at the rate of this frame, and then it drops off again. And the result is when you um, put together all of the forces and figure out all the potential energy is that you get this sort of plateau at L4 and L5, okay? So there was a little bit of physics in there and I apologize, but um, I find that kind of interesting. And um, you may see these pictures and that's basically what's going on. And if, if something starts out close to here and then gets away, it gets pulled back in and sort of circles this point. And to explain that, then we need Nikolai's force, the Coriolis force, and we're not going there. Okay. So now we can take a look again at this picture. So I need to stop this and share it again. Okay, so here's Uh, one, two, okay, that must be the Earth there, and that's Mars. And so again, you see that these swarms are really quite extended, but they, when the asteroids get outside of the orbit of Jupiter, they sort of drop back. And when they get inside the orbit of Jupiter, they catch up and they just sort of, the, if I follow any one dot, so oh, it's, it's really just doing a slightly distorted orbit. 
but when I sort of look at the cluster, I see this sort of swarming effect, okay? So that's the motion of the um, Trojan asteroids. So let me see if I can get this. Where, there we are. Okay. Okay, so now we can talk a little bit about the Lucy mission. Um, we've got enough language to talk about that. So the Lucy mission launched on October 2021st, 2021. By 2033, it's going to have visited Donald Johansson in the main um, belt. It'll go to four Trojan asteroids in the L4 swarm and a binary, so a pair of asteroids in the L5 swarm. Now, this was what caught my attention when I first saw this you know, a couple of years ago. It's gonna go there, and then it's gonna go there, and those two places are farther apart than the distance from Earth to Jupiter. To me, that's pretty cool, right? Must be rocket science. Um, so it's interesting to me to, to sort of understand how it's doing that. So now I want to talk a little bit about the mission itself. So the spacecraft is, um, it's a bit of an economy model. Um, it's pretty simple. It's got three main in instruments and a um, tracking camera. It's got um, these two circular um, solar arrays, which are kind of standard out of the parts bin at, at NASA. So they use them on the uh, Mars InSight lander. They use the same sort of thing on the Cygnus cargo craft that goes up to the um, space station. Um, and the three main instruments on here are instruments that have already been used on other um, missions as well. So there's sort of the scale of this. Um, for Lucy, they've all got an L apostrophe at the beginning, but this one is a visible in instrument, visible imager and infrared mapper um, from the New Horizons. That was the mission that went to the, what was formerly a planet known as Pluto. Um, and this one is also from New Horizons. That's a high resolution imager. And there's a, an infrared um, spectrometer that was like the one that was on the OSIRIS-REx mission, which was the one, I don't, that was quite a while ago now, I guess, or five years ago or so, um, that went to Bennu. Um, and then there's also a tracking camera. So a fairly simple instrument, um, a set of instruments, a fairly um, simple probe and, so this is the trajectory that I first saw, and it's a little bit misleading. We'll see why in a minute. Um, but Lucy was launched on an Atlas rocket, okay? And, and I guess Atlas is a pretty good rocket and they've been sort of evolving, but that goes back to the 60s. Um, it's now United Launch Alliance. Um, and I think this one actually used uh, Russian motors, um, but that's not a rocket that you would normally think of as getting something out to Jupiter. Um, so it needed some help and it, it got that help from gravity assist. And in fact, there are two gravity assists. The first one happened last fall and the second one's gonna happen next year, okay? Um, and then, it, so it will then visit Donald Johansson as it goes um, through the, uh, main asteroid belt um, in 2025. It'll get to the L4 swarm. And you see it's actually going in the opposite direction to um, Jupiter's rotation here. Um, and it'll visit the four asteroids there, but it doesn't have enough juice to stay in that orbit. It, it can't, it doesn't have enough energy to orbit at the distance of Jupiter. 
So it'll fall back down and then uh, pass Earth again and go up and visit the binary pair of asteroids in the L5 swarm. And then it will drop back to Earth. And in fact, it's set up in such a way that it can sort of oscillate between the L4 swarm and the L5 swarm, I think with a period of about six years. So in principle, it can keep going. Now, whether it has power to do that, I'm not sure. So I've written down the names of the um, asteroids it's visiting, but it doesn't matter. So there are two gravity assists here, um, but this uh, picture looks a little surrealistic, but the reason is that again, this is the picture from the frame that's rotating with Jupiter. So if you're an observer sitting on Jupiter, would see it go over here and then over here because this swarm is always in that location relative to Jupiter. This swarm is always in this location relative to Jupiter. And if we look at this from sort of the omniscient view, so the view that's sort of stationary over the sun, it's a little easy to, easier to see. So I'll let this loop, oh, do I need to, can you see this one? Okay. So I'll let this um, loop a couple times. The Earth is the dark blue here. The magenta is Lucy and um, the green is Donald Johansson. We won't worry about that too much. The cyan is one of the asteroids in the L4 swarm and the red is one of the asteroids in the L5 swarm. So I'll wait till it starts now and then try and I wish I, I tried to slow this down and I couldn't, it would help. Okay, so launch, first gravity assist, it comes out a little bit further. Second gravity assist gets enough of a kick to get up to L4, there it is, it meets the L4 swarm, goes back in, circles Earth, and now time perfectly to meet the L5 swarm. Um, that third, trip past the Earth isn't actually gravity assist. At that point, it's sort of into this orbit and it just keeps orbiting. Um, so I found this sort of made things a lot clearer to me. Um, so I wanna say a little bit then about the gravity assist because that's what's making this possible. Um, so what happens is that if an object swings past the planet, interacts with it gravitationally, it'll accelerate due to the planet's gravity and some momentum will be transferred to it from the planet. Um, now, if it just sort of goes past the planet and leaves on more or less the same trajectory, then it gives back all that momentum. But if its trajectory changes, it can actually take a little bit of momentum from the planet um, so the planet loses a bit of momentum, but the mass of the planet is gazillion times bigger than the mass of the probe. So there's no noticeable change in the velocity. And probably the most famous example of this is um, the Voyager probes, which took advantage of the fact that um, the outer planets were lined up in a particularly convenient way in the end of the 70s. Um, for the Voyager probes to get gravity assists. Um, I don't know if they got any before they got to Jupiter, but certainly once they got to Jupiter, that sort of uh, helped them go through the whole um, uh, set of outer planets. And that was called the Grand Tour. So I just wanna say a little word about gravity assists. So this is an analogy that you sometimes see and this is a truck and a tennis ball coming towards the truck. And so the truck is moving for the observer in the truck. And, and these aren't the pictures, the arrows I've gotten here right now. If you're in the truck and you see a tennis ball coming, um, you'll see it hit. And then from your point of view, it will bounce off and travel away at the same speed that it was coming in. Okay, that's from your point of view. But from the point of view of an outside observer, 
this ball has bounced off this truck, this truck is moving, that ball is going to be moving a lot faster after that interaction. Now, that's not a perfect analogy for a gravity assist, um, but it's that sort of idea. So there's a, a fellow named David Short. I found this um, GIF on, uh, or GIF on Wikipedia. And so this is uh, a planet and maybe a probe coming past the planet from the, um, and so there's a gravitational interaction between the probe and the planet that changes the path of the probe. And, but from the point of view of the planet, the velocity or the speed when it's coming in and the speed when it's going out is the same. The amount of kinetic energy is the same, but from the point of view of the, um, of a stationary observer, you know, fixed with the sun, sort of watching the planet, the planet is moving along. And when this object passes the planet, it gets towed along by the planet and takes away some of its momentum. So that's what a gravity assist is. And so again, um, I've already shown you this, but now let's just watch the graph because I just love this one. Um, so let it start again. So there's the earth. Okay. Oh, the date, date's up there. Uh, so we start at 2021, 20, there we are. There's the launch, first gravity assist, second gravity assist, out to L4, loops back to the earth, but doesn't really get a gravity assist now, doesn't change the orbit very much. And then L5. So, so there are, I'm just about done, there are, there is an issue that has arisen. So after the probe is launched, these um, circular solar rays have to unfurl and lock into place. And that didn't quite happen on one side. One of them um, didn't quite latch open. It's about 75 to 95% open. They aren't quite sure. They've tried shaking it a little bit. Um, as far as they're concerned, it looks like it's okay. It looks like it's stable, even though it hasn't latched. And they've got lots of time to think about it. So they're just going to go ahead. So they've identified what caused it. They don't think it's a, a risk. And whether and one of the things they could do is try reeling it back in and opening it back up. But they're going to do a lot of simulations before they um, do anything about that. But interestingly, one of these other applications had an even more um, serious problem. So this was um, last fall, one of the Cygnus uh, got it. Okay, one of the Cygnus cargo ships. Only one of the arrays opened at all. Um, so there may be some issues with these arrays, but it still worked okay. Um, so this is the last thing. There is a plaque. Um, you, some of you may remember that there was a, um, a plaque on the Voyagers, and I think there was a record too. Um, and it was, it was all mathematical because they figured that if anybody was going to find the Voyagers, it, was gonna be, it wasn't going to be humans. And so they had symbols that sort of indicated where the sun is. And I think they had the um, a special frequency of um, hydrogen in there so that and coded in some way um, so that uh, another kind of civilization could interpret that. Um, so they did the same thing on this, but this probe is never going to get away from the earth. It's going to revisit the earth every um, six years. So they didn't figure they had to be too tricky about how they encoded the information. So what they did was just put on a lot of quotes and, you know, a picture of the mission that, so that does sort of represent the mission. So here, there are 20 quotes from people like Albert Einstein. Okay, that makes sense. Carl Sagan, I got to John Lennon. I thought, well, yeah, he's cool. Davis Sobel, some of you may have read books by her. I really like her books. Um, 
I think the last book I read by her was um, The Glass something about the women astronomers in the early 1900s. Um, Martin Luther King, that's cool. George Harrison, well, not a philosopher, but that's okay. Ringo Starr, okay. And then, of course, it struck me, oh, I understand why, it's because it's Lucy, right? Um, there's obviously a bit of a, a theme there. Um, Brian May, because he's an astrophysicist. Um, so you probably can't read it, but what's, what's Ringo Starr's quote? Anybody ever heard an interview by Ringo Starr? We're, we're not cool enough. <laughs> he always says, peace and love. And there is peace and, peace and love. Um, the rest of them. Uh, and John Lennon said, we all shine on like the moon and the stars and stuff. That's pretty cool. Um, anyway, so that, uh, yeah, I think that's it. So, yes. How much uh, ability do you have to spare I don't know, and they must be able to do a little bit. They have to be able to do a little bit because when they get close to the asteroids, they have to. They have specific targets in mind in the, in the field? Well, they, they're going to specific, yeah, they're going to five, six specific asteroids. So they must have that kind of yeah, but they'll get close, but they do have to probably make some corrections. Now, I don't know where diamond is going to be when all this is going on but someone should get in touch with nasa and say look there's an asteroid up there called diamond if there's any chance you've got to give it a shot right um so any other questions yeah so great presentation by the way okay i've told you everything i know so you can go ahead and ask but good luck so the, the two scientists that you mentioned, Lagrange and Euler, yeah. back in the day in, when I took meteorology way back, um, we learned about them in, in a sense where, you know, for the Lagrangian, you're moving with the target. For the Eulerian, you're looking from the Omni, what did you call it? Omni um, I just sort of made that up, but. Yeah. And, we, we, we learned that, and I'm not going to go into deep detail, but when you get wide tracking supercell storms, those produce tornadoes, but you got to look at them from the Eulerian point to deduce that. You can't deduce that from the Lagrangian point. So, okay, so that's probably different from this. Now, these guys did a lot of stuff. Um, in, in mechanics, um, there's a way to, to analyze moving systems using something called the Lagrangian. Um, it's like, it's a way of writing down, um, you probably remember, Rick, um, writing down something that's like an energy, but not quite. Yeah, yes. And you take derivatives of it and you can figure things out from that. So that's, we're we're really sort of getting beyond what I can do, but I wouldn't be surprised if Lagrange used that in figuring out Lagrange points. But you can use Lagrangians to understand any kind of motions, and it's probably, as you said, it's a different point of view. And 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 Euler, I, I think of Euler as the guy who gave us. Um, uh, the Euler formula, sort of complex numbers and E, so don't worry about this, E to the I theta equals sine theta plus I, no, plus I cos theta, or no, the other way around, cos theta <laughs> plus I sine theta. So that's what I think of as Euler. Um, but they did incredible stuff. Both of them were amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. and Just, sorry. Go, no, oh. no, 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 Quick second question. Um, the, the animation you show with the asteroids sloshing back and forth yeah. within their own swarm cloud, if you, and that's what I would call it, if you call the Eulerian perspective because you're looking at the cloud itself, if you, if you do that 
the way those asteroids are moving and you know there's a there. whatever that's called is that similar to uh you know when i saw that i thought of sesh waves is that similar uh, you thought of what sesh waves the waves that yeah okay um is that completely different or is that the same principle i well waves? number one i don't know what that is um in the pool when the water is no because like it's that. not really sloshing here if you look what they're doing they're sort of all the ones on this side are going a little bit slower and then when they get on this side they're speeding up but if you look at any one of them it's just going around but sometimes it's on the outside and slows down and sometimes it's on the inside and speeds up now maybe that is a bit like sloshing because they slow down and speed up they would repeat themselves over and over and over, and over. more or less yeah but I guess the bulge, if you will, go seems to go back and forth. From <coughs> oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it could. It could be. Yeah. So, it, I mean, yeah, when you get into cool. waves, you get group velocity and phase velocity, and there's there's something. Don't worry about that. There's something like that maybe going on here. So you, yeah, I, I think maybe you're right. <clears throat> I was just going to make a comment on the uh, Newtonian gravity. I was blown by this. This, this particular graphic here is uh, mind blowing for me um, because of the, the the orbiting within an orbit going on in this. As this that's yeah. So we motion. remember what they're really doing is just a slightly distorted orbit. So well, it's, it's if you. Well. It's a yeah, well, and it's in there, and it's and it's rotating around depending on where they are. In the okay, so this is where it's not a potential well. It's like a uh, um, a plateau, and it falls off on all sides within the frame of reference that goes around with the planet. The extra thing that's going on here is. The Coriolis force, Coriolis and and then yeah. that's what makes it so that picture isn't in that sort of contour map. That's what sort of gives you the bowl shape, I guess. That's right, and they're stable, and then so within there, there's 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 motion that's stable within that. Yeah. Those potential levels. But this is what 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 impresses me is that all of this is. Is Newtonian gravity, and that's basically exact to a certain number of yeah. decimal places. So I, I'm, I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, where before I thought it was 99.9 percent .9 accurate, but I'm thinking it's a few more nines. There. And I'm just wondering well, how, how accurate is no? There may be predicting these these orbits. I'm not sure if these are exactly periodic, there may be. I think they're chaotic. I, yeah, I was just gonna say, there's probably, they probably don't repeat exactly. Um, I think for these purposes, I, I'm i not a relativity guy. Well, this, so. is not, this is beyond relativity at this point. But I'm thinking just how good is Newtonian gravity? Well, pretty good. It's pretty good. Not, yeah, for this kind of stuff. Yeah. So. I guess the question also that would come from that is that, well, how long do they stay in this orbit? Like when they, how many, how many, how often do I? I don't know. That's a, that's an excellent question. I don't know. Um, they've been there a few billion years, presumably. Or longer. Or longer. I mean, if they formed when Jupiter formed, um, you know, one of these hypotheses is that, you know, they sort of got there when Jupiter formed. So that's, you're getting back four or 5 billion years. So I don't, I don't think they're getting repopulated. I don't think that there probably are some that get picked up from the asteroid belt. Um, but that's why they're interested in these guys because it probably is a stable population that hasn't been worked over by collisions and they haven't had close approaches to the sun or anything weird like that. Um, and they want to look at it because nobody's looked at it before. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. That's a great mission. Yep. 
just looking at that graphic, that reminds me of the um, flocking phenomenon of starlings. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was used apparently in the matrix, you know, with all those machines. But I also saw, um, with regard to that, I saw an interesting program about mathematical codes in nature. And some scientists have actually worked out a mathematical code that explains how these birds, because really that's what they do, they swirl around, but then they come back and they're going in the same direction. And apparently, you know, from, through computer simulations and photographing these swarms, these flocks, they've actually worked out a mathematical Yeah, but code some, somehow they are, quite they're sort of, I one way to talk about this is that L4 and L5 are attractors. If we yeah. use sort of the chaos language. And oh, yeah. in the birds, there's some sort of attractor that we don't quite understand. Yeah, that because it's mathematically apparently very almost symmetrical yeah. in the way they actually yeah. arrange. I mean, the physics is, must be different. Each other, which is, I mean, you know, so it's not random, for one thing. Yeah. Apparently. So, yeah. yeah, and this is certainly not random. So if this force that you were talking about explains one of, is one of the explanations of it staying in that format, why would we call it fictitious? I'm a bit confused about that. I know it's sort of like a physics <laughs> term, but, you know, it's, at least they're real. Okay. They do things, they, they explain phenomena, why are they fictitious? In this frame, they, 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 they aren't, okay. So it's, it's like when I was doing this, okay, right. for you sitting there, if you were analyzed, so let's not <laughs> let's not get in let's not get into Coriolis force because it's okay, well, just, I, I think it, it's more complicated. But from this point of view, okay, from your point of view, if I'm analyzing this, I can ignore gravity pulling down because it's right. weak compared to this. The only force acting on um, that mass is the string pulling it towards the center. We call that the centripetal force. And if I let go of the string or if I break it, the mass does not travel out along a radius. It travels along a tangent, yeah. okay? And so there is no other force acting on this. And so any other force would have to be fictitious. That's why we call it fictitious force. But if I, so we, we say that whenever we can, we try and do physics in the frame of reference you're in, which is a frame of reference that is not accelerating. Okay, that's sitting still, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll get to that in a second, yeah. Um, um, so we, we try and do the physics in a frame of reference that isn't accelerating. That's a preferred frame. We call it an inertial frame. Um, but sometimes you are on something that's rotating. The, the earth rotates. Are we moving anyway? We're the earth moving. rotates, yeah. but to a very good approximation, we can treat this room as if it's not accelerating. Yeah. But if we want to do meteorology, we have to take into account the fact that the earth rotates. Yeah. And then basically when we transform our point of view into this rotating frame of reference, the only way we can understand how things are moving is to insert these extra forces. And as long as we keep in our mind that there is no, you know, the, for, the force that's holding onto this is a real force. It's the force exerted by that string. The, the force that I think is pulling this mass outwards I can't find a cause for that force. It's really an illusion because of the fact that this, it, it from this frame. So it's not fictitious. I think maybe it's the word that's been developed. Yeah, but we, I, well, okay. it's been it's around, really it's been around for, no, it's not a real force because you can't find a cause for that force. Okay. Take the room analogy. If you started to walk through this room north real fast, yeah. just pretend you're following the surface of the Earth and you're doing that. As you do that, you're getting closer to the rotational axis of the Earth. And just like a figure skater pulling his or her arms in, you're going to spin faster. So you're, you're, going, to be, you're going to be dragged to, to the right, to the east, by 
something you can't figure out because you're assuming the, the, you're, you're a that's a Coriolis that's a Coriolis yeah. force, right? Um, but you have no why on earth am I being dragged to the right just because I'm going that direction? Right? You can't find something that's actually pushing on you, and the the reason is that trying to do physics in a rotating frame isn't a good idea unless you're Nikolai. <laughs> and I guess that's why airplanes don't take the right routes when you look at the map, they go, they go from Europe to America, they go like this. And if so, you're... So how can you explain uh, the success of meteorology? <laughs> okay, that's probably getting off topic. Okay, so um, there's there's a question in the chat. Uh, okay, so John asked the Lucy probe will just fly by the Trojans, correct, or will it get to spend any time around? That's a great question. And the um, let me go back to. Uh, one of these pictures. There. Um, so John, they just zip by. They, the, the, the probe doesn't stay, doesn't travel with the asteroids. In fact, it's going, the asteroids are moving this way and the probe is moving sort of against them. So it's gonna zip past them, has to get the pictures fairly quickly. Um, it doesn't have enough energy to stay in, in that orbit. Um, it's just gonna sort of pop up, have a look and drop back down again. And that's why it's got fairly simple um, instruments on it. It can take a few pictures, do some spectroscopy and then it's on to the next one. and six years later it can come back and maybe find another couple asteroids but i don't know if they they probably have planned that far ahead but they aren't saying that yet so i don't know did that uh did that help john thoughts on yeah like new horizons yeah just goes by gets pictures on its way by okay Quick question. chris um but the total amount of mass in each of these Trojan swarms is, despite the fact the picture makes it look huge and vast, the total, these are all tiny, tiny dust specks compared to Jupiter. So the total amount of mass in each of these Trojan swarms is actually practically negligible. There's no self-gravity involved. I, in yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, every, every one of these little green dots, you can just ignore all the other. The, the, the physics would become even more horrible if you had to, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's bad enough being a three body problem if it's a million body problem. There, say there are binaries amongst Yeah, so there is there is some gravity. Yeah. Yeah, like really really close. But you know, one binary and another binary don't really feel each other. Yeah. So what's the range of size of the uh asteroids in there? Well, the ones um bigger than a kilometer up to a few kilometers. Than... <clears throat> I'm not sure. Um, what's that? Yeah. 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 It could be. A, could be a few kilometers, but it's probably. It's probably like the one that the Dart mission visited. They're, they aren't things like Ceres. They aren't, you know, sort of minor planets. They're. I don't think so. Um, but I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know actually the size of these ones that it's visiting. And certainly a few kilometers. Certainly, it would have to be incredibly accurate to get to it. Yeah. Um, they, I mean, they're big enough that they can see them now from Earth. So uh, maybe they are, maybe they are bigger than, you know, maybe the tens or twenties kilometers, something like that. Okay. Sorry, I, I should have had a look at that, but I, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Are you looking it up? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so any other questions? Okay, then I'll uh, wrap up that part and uh, ask the chair to come back and uh, continue the meeting.
We should thank the chair for so. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Well, that'd be nice. Okay. So, um, can you see that one now? Okay. So the next thing I put in, um, which may or may not have uh, uh, any input, but uh, it is January. So um, I was wondering if anybody had any uh, exciting astronomy related gifts and there's mine, which was a puzzle, which actually is finished now. This was yesterday. Um, so it's pretty cool. I, I had a lot of fun doing it. And uh, my next thing is I got to figure out how to glue it all together and preserve it and stick it on the wall. But I have a kit for doing that. Anyways, it's sort of a vintage uh, chart and there's actually a lot of information on it. How big is it? Um, 28 by 22. 28 inches by 22 inches. Pretty big size. Uh, so any other gifts that anybody wants to report? Where did you get that? I got that at the Botanical Gardens gift shop. Oh. They have... So gift to yourself. Well, Cynthia and I were in and I sort of pointed at it and then looked the <laughs> other way. Um, it's made by... Oh, you can't read it there. I think it's Cavelli Papers or something like that. And they have lots of bird-themed ones, but that's one that caught my eye. Any other gift reports? Okay. Scopes at Costco that they have to reduce the price. Okay. Uh, I got a, I got a um, mini PC to attach to my scope. So that's a, a very, very specific request to Santa Claus. Yeah, well, very, very specific. Okay. I, uh, I got a rather unique gift. A friend of mine is helping somebody. Um, they have a specialized laser printer. It prints on tombstones. Right. So we downloaded uh, web, uh, web pictures and made up a special plaque for me, um, maybe that thick, uh, yay big uh, web pictures. Oh, very nice. I have my own tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it'll just be decorative for uh, quite a while yet. Oh, cool. I discovered that I think this the, the globe out there I put it on top of a floor lamp once they go inside. It really looks good and the detail is, is quite good on for, for something like that. So how, how big is the moon? It's probably the size of say a five pin bowling ball. Okay. So I said, now I want you to do one for Mars and I want one for the Earth. So okay, that's the next two years <laughs> Very nice. So you did it on a 3D printer. It looked really good. Cool. So we did have some uh, interesting Christmas gifts. Okay, thanks. Um, so the next order of business is the uh, member observations. Uh, we normally go through pictures. There are a few, but uh, even though it's been an extra week since our last meeting, we've only had about four nice nights and maybe it was only three and a half, but um, we normally have pictures, but Gary, you were doing some visual observing. You want to say anything about what you're up to? I've oh. been uh, doing a lot of visual observing of the planets, uh, of uh, Mars and that. Yeah. That's what I was thinking about. Uh, <laughs> uh, clouds and, and blue clearing is a big thing now. And blue clearing, there's two sides to it. People say that it doesn't exist, say it does exist. And I talk about new clouds. So it's a lot of that going on. And this year, it's looking at Mars after 50 years of looking at Mars. Uh, this is the first and last year. For detail, you're seeing detail that people haven't seen in years. Matter of fact, 
the uh, uh, Cyrus to triangle, and you go off and this is what they, they call it four, we'll do that two feet. Usually you can see that quite easily. And this year, because there hasn't been very much frost, like uh, 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 most of the, the, the frost seems to have gone, it has blended in. And it's the first time where you actually have a hard time seeing the fork. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the detail, I picked up about uh, five different areas that have were dropped off the map because the uh, they weren't seen, the last map they were seen on was in the 50s, 52. And since then, they haven't been able to be seen because of the, the surface has always been cloudy or, or frost. And these past two, last year, uh, two years ago, this year, then the frost hasn't gotten, and the clearing is really gone. Like, uh, you can see how people back in the 20s, when they were observing, they said, you know, like, oh, this is the season, it's growing, right? And in actual fact, it looks like you can hardly see the arm or the bend in the fork. It's so close. There's so much detail there now, as opposed to like, it would be a, a green uh, and a blue and an orange, but now it's all blended in. Hmm. Do you think that's Earth or Mars? That's oh, that's Earth. definitely Mars. Yeah. So right. climate climate change on Mars. Uh, and it's the first time I've seen the uh, uh, the ice cap broken up to myself. Like you can say, like I've seen it uh, come down to you know like sixty degrees latitude, and it goes back, and you'll see what they call a lone uh, bar, where the uh, the ice is melted, but the water is still wet. And you can see that really clear. This year you can't see hardly any of that. But hmm. You can see that people always talk about like there's a mountain here and a mountain here. And like that. Keep looking. Is that still visible? That's still visible. Uh, it's good until the end of until it becomes about eight degrees for visibility. Okay. If you got a camera, you're good until four degrees diameter. Wow. wow. But if you it's, it's the looking and using the uh, filters. Really brings it out. What filter would be? Uh, the uh, blue for the clouds, and there's lots of cloud activity. I mean, you, uh, I saw it, and then you, your picture showed it. That was really cool, yeah. right? And uh, while looking under green, you can see that's a cloud, but under yellow, you can tell the difference between a white cloud and what they call blue clouds. So this is a good ad for our talk next month. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I just want to know that getting amateur observing weather reports from Mars is pretty cool. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So we do have a few pictures. Um, so we are calming. We are just talking about Mars and. Uh, um, we had three Thursdays in a row that were reasonably clear. So some of us were out observing. So I was trying Mars and I think that's the cloud you were talking about there, right? Yeah. And, uh, so Gary was interpreting the pictures for me a little bit. So, um, some shots of Mars and I did some with, with Jupiter and I was really pleased to see the red spot a couple of times. Um, and some moons. And uh, then there were a bunch of us that did uh, M42. So uh, Jim did uh, this one, and lovely swirly bits in that. And, uh, I think we got all the, the information there. And it led to some discussion about that object, which Chris told us was a Strong rim sphere. Strong rim sphere. Very simple H two. Simple nebula around one star. Yeah, and that's is that M forty three? That is M forty three. Yeah. And Bernard, um, Bernard, are you online? Do you want to just say a word about this? So, Bernard, of course, sent us something spectacular. Uh, uh, yes. Can you hear me, there, guys? Oh, he says he's talking, but I don't hear him yet. Can you hear me, guys? Oh, let me turn. Okay, hang on. Try now. 
Kiss, can you hear me, guys? Yeah, yes. got you now. Okay. Uh, yeah, this was about uh, a week or two before Christmas there, and uh, it was a real cold night, uh, clear night. Uh, it was the last time I was at the observatory, actually. Uh, I haven't had a real good uh, chance or a good clear night since, but uh, yeah, uh, I did uh, just did some 30 second exposures. Uh, uh, what was that? About three over three hours there, and uh, did this one with the uh, Sharp Cap, or Sharp Star 61, and uh, I had the uh, UV IR filter on that one. So, yeah, it turned out uh, a little different from uh, some of the views I've seen here, but uh, I uh, did some uh, did the uh, processing of Pix Insight and uh, and Photoshop, and uh, uh, the colors turned out a bit different. Uh, so. Not quite sure uh, why, but <laughs> anyway, there it is. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, I think it turned out pretty good. Can't hear you, Mike. Yeah, Bernard, I was just saying that. Uh, thank you for that. And it's uh, quite a spectacular picture. There's a uh, tremendous amount of detail in there. There's a lot more nebulosity that the projector is not showing. No. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Right. Um, too bad. What's the video? What's that? Yeah. <laughs> what was that? I, 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 uh, I tried to. And uh, so this one, uh, I got a modified uh, camera from Jim Johnson. So with the uh, IR filter taken off. And uh, this was a very cold night, but I lasted for uh, a little while. So I'm pretty pleased with that because when I've done this before with my other camera, I don't get nearly as much red stuff. So for me, I was pretty happy with that. Um, and John Nugent uh, did, uh, what's the six point, six something hours? Yeah, and that's a beautiful shot. You can see the running man there. It's actually oriented so you can see him running away. And... Uh, Again, lots of nebulosity in that one. And uh, Jim, I don't think Jim's online tonight, but he did uh, the Rosette Nebula. And there was some discussion about palettes that came out of this. I think this is called the SHO palette. Um, yeah, the Hubble palette. Um, so just beautiful detail in there. And, and, and the, the dust is... Quite pretty. And so now um, I'll invite uh, Robert to come down and do the sky this month, and I'll bring up the uh, PDF for that. Hmm. Oh, there we are. Yeah. I'll just say something just before, just in between. Um, it's really, it really comes under visual observing, or rather, not visible, visible um, visual observing. When I was, at, I've been, I was at the Yukon for six weeks. Oh yeah, please tell us about that. It was mostly cloud skies, believe it or not. Um, and then when it got really, really cold, it went down to minus forty overnight. So, um, oh. and it was still cloudy. The only really clear days or or, eat, or nights um, were about two at the very beginning of my stay, and I was still jet lag. And I got up one morning, of course, it's still dark at nine thirty, and I did do a bit of stargazing at nine thirty in the morning, and it was crystal clear, it's beautiful. But uh, you know, I mean, it was minus twenty five, and I lasted very little time. I went inside, but no, unfortunately, no northern lights, no really clear skies, unless it was bitterly, bitterly cold. So. Mm. Not the time to go for Stargate. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, thank you for that. Yeah. Robert, Happy you. Christmas present, Johnson, Warren, Boxing Day. So, oh. Oh. Best Christmas present. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Am I in the right place? Yep. Okay. You can see that, Randy. Okay, let's see this month, uh, what we have up. I can't even pronounce that. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I came across that somewhere in my travels when I was trying to get a, a, a scientific word for like day night cycle. And I thought about circadian, but that's more or less like a, a human bio, biological thing or not just human, certainly, but life's biological cycle. But I came across that there and apparently that's the right word. So, <laughs> so I thought I'd just leave it there. Um, so uh, about the day-night cycle, well, uh, you can certainly uh, have a look at this online if you want to see when astronomical twilight and nautical twilight and civil twilight uh, begin and, and, uh, and end and our sunrise and sunset times. Uh, here's uh, the sun actually today and uh, quite a lot of activity. Mm -hmm. Uh, up there, so if we could only get uh, some sunshine and uh, you have a solar scope, uh, then, you know, uh, treat yourself and uh, set it up and try and have a look. Uh, I thought I'd add something in for the moon. Usually we don't have much there for the moon, uh, but uh, it's pretty much unchanging, isn't it, month to month. Well, on February 4th, the moon will be at apogee, its greatest distance from the Earth this year. Be sure to take a look at this month's full moon as it will be the smallest in uh, appearance for this year, right? And the opposite of supermoon and, you know, media has made a big thing of supermoons in the past few years, right? And people thinking that it's, oh, you know, it's going to be uh, as big as the whole sky or something. But anyway, uh, I noticed uh, the last full moon that, oh yeah, I could see that that's a small, it's smaller in diameter than moons I've seen in the past. So by all means, get out and have a look. Um, Mercury is uh, passed in, is that inferior solar conjunction, so not observable, observable, but actually I think this week is just starting to uh, come up out of the, um, on the horizon. Uh, so you might actually be able to catch it. And uh, I think similar for Venus. Venus is probably, whoops, a little uh, better actually. Um, the mouse is pretty touchy. Yeah, the mouse is touchy, yeah. So, um, yeah, you could try for Venus and possibly Mercury right about now, but as the month progresses, it will certainly get to be more visible in the sky, especially Venus. Uh, Mars currently in the evening sky becomes visible about five o'clock or so, 43 degrees above the horizon. So, and as Gary said, absolutely uh, get a chance have a look because it is receding from our particular pers perspective as the year goes by. Uh, Jupiter is following in the footsteps of uh, Mars, but still is an early evening object receding into the evening twilight, visible about five o'clock as well, 41 degrees above the southern horizon, sets at 10.30 or so. Uh, Saturn uh, soon passed behind the sun at solar conjunction. It will become visible around uh, 5.30 or so, but only 12 degrees. So uh, yeah, that's a little bit tough. And uh, Uranus early evening receding into twilight. Um, possible to resolve into a disk around seven o'clock. Its highest point uh, is 58 degrees, and then it sinks below 21 in the western horizon. Right. So challenging. Can I just point out uh, that uh, Sky News mentions Venus and Saturn and the crescent moon on the 23rd. Oh, yeah? In a few days. Okay. Uh, Venus, well, they, want, they thought to point it out. Venus and Saturn are 0.4 degrees apart, and the crescent moon is. Okay, so that's a, 
snowing. Well, I hope you're wrong, but <laughs> in, the, in the evening sky. Yes, in the evening sky. Yeah, so that would be a nice sight. Yeah, visible sight certainly, right? Yeah, I must have missed that. Uh, Comet Roundup. Uh, so there's buzz on the go for this C22. C 2022 E3 ZTF um, currently residing around about uh, Corona Borealis. Um, I think that's a morning. Yeah. Morning. Early morning, I think. Uh, I'm not sure when it passes into our evening sky, but it may be too dim by the time it does that. I think it's like this month is about the best, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, you know, uh, worthwhile having a look for, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Haven't seen one in a while now, right? You know, to be able to see a tail or anything like that. So, yeah. Keep your eye on that. Uh, asteroids, you can look up. Um, from our website, this document, if you want to have a go at them. Uh, the next uh, meteor shower is going to be in April, I think, is this? April 22nd. Yeah, and that's the Lyrids. Um, 10 per hour. Whoops. Oh, oh, yeah, I said touch your mouse. You're, you're yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely right about that. Okay. Uh, and uh, if you want a challenge, uh, binocular deep sky objects for January and February are listed here, as well as telescopic uh, deep sky objects, right? I don't know of anybody who's ever uh, tried. I think Bernard? Bernard? Werner uh, may have done this one point, but I'm not sure. And uh, there is a challenge object there for February. And yes, and for January as well. Uh, IC2118 in, in Eridanus. And then uh, for February, IC443 in Gemini. I'm not sure what these objects are. They're probably uh, probably an open cluster, maybe. I'm not sure, though. But uh, they were the challenge objects that uh, come, you know, with every month's uh, with every month's data that uh, I gather for uh, for this document. Uh, International Space Station. I'm not sure if. We have yeah, there's a lot of visible ones there. So yeah, you could have a look and see. Whoops, if you can uh, catch one of these passages. And for more dates and times, the website is listed there. Uh, currently, um, it's possible that we could do an observing session out at the uh, park, except for, uh, you know, it's questionable and you'd have to, if we do get the sky to do so, <clears throat> and if uh, I then, you know, uh, put a call out on the talk list, uh, then it's not impossible that we could have a session at the park because right now there's not much snow down, so or there's no snow down. <laughs> you better do it this week. Yeah. <laughs> You'll have a well, clear night Sunday night, but that's after our snowstorm. So. Ah, uh, but it's not. And no, it's not a snowstorm. Is it? Oh, Saturday we're getting a snowstorm. Oh no! Yes. Originally, I thought it was a snow. No, it was. Snow. When does it stop? May start. No stop. Stop like Sunday morning. Oh, oh. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll be snow clearing that. In other words, yeah. <clears throat> ah. I was having a good night until you spoke up. <laughs> you can focus on the positive that it's going to be clear. 
Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you gotta yeah, get the snow blower at the clear spot first, right? Yeah. I've done that before. Okay. Uh so then our calendars here shown, you know, when the moon is in uh, its uh, uh full first quarter new last quarter and when our monthly meeting is which is tonight of course for this month and for next month and some websites and any questions it's, uh, something happening to the comet now the uh, tail is getting disconnected by the sun yeah, I saw some. I saw something about that. Is that right? Oh, mm. so yeah, there's a there was a picture somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. okay well, thank, thank you very much. Okay, so I actually um, did get a, uh, a screenshot from Stellarium for tonight. So there's uh, the handle of the Big Dipper and Hercules. So right now it's just about in between, and this is at five in the morning. So it, I think it sort of it's it's circumpolar, so it doesn't quite set, but it's pretty close to the horizon until um, sort of after midnight. So if there's a clear night, if there's a clear night, I might. I don't want to ruin your fun, but it will be raining or snowing at that hour. <laughs> <laughs> no donuts for him. <laughs> okay, so um, that wraps it up. The next meeting, Gary's going to tell us about filters, which he's already started doing. And um, if you're interested in this comet observing workshop, because we just talked about comets, but apparently we're never going to see it. Um, you can get a hold of this person, Ellen, uh, at Kitchener Waterloo, or ask us. We can send you this Zoom link, and you basically register there, and then it sends you the actual link. So this is not the link to watch it. This is the link to get approved. And that's it. So meeting adjourned. So thank you. And we have refreshments. Whoa.